Wolfgang is going to talk about uh, uh, one model of uh, mathematical model of COVID, which has been accepted by European Union as one of the three uh, main models used to focus COVID. And now I give the floor to Wolfgang. Thank you very much, Misha. I hope everybody can understand me. Uh, yeah, good morning to, to Brazil. Um, it's actually a big pleasure to give a talk in your seminar here. Um, yes, as Misha said already, the, um, the model I'm discussing about today is um, actually coming from a, from a bigger group. You see it already on the, on the screen, it's called MOCOS. Um, yeah, well, MOCOS, I know it's, uh, in, it's, it's, it sounds much better in German than in English. And, and, and Spanish and Portuguese. Um, but um, so the Mocos International Research Group was actually modeling Corona spread. That's why it's called Mocos. Uh, it's a it's a national research group um, from from Poland actually initiated. Um, I'm a member in the German charter chapter, and there's also a Philippine chapter and an Indian chapter. Actually, I'll talk about this a bit at the end. And um, you're all using some of the the same modeling technique for COVID-19, which we developed, especially at the beginning of the, the pandemic. Um, so this, uh, the, the method that we use, some of you maybe have heard about the, the model from Ferguson and the model from Nikki Popper from Vienna. Um, so they are, they are somehow related or yeah, some more, more or less the same class. It's an agent based model. And, um, Today I want to discuss a bit about, let's say the, as we all know, uh, last one and a half years of pandemic and uh, from a modeling point of view um, and, and more like a pragmatic modeling point of view. So I will tell you some of the obstacles that we have. Um, I will tell you how we solved some things and um, I will give you some, some results, um, also quite recent results. Um, so, I am, my outline for today will be um, I'll talk a bit about modeling diseases and some, especially some issues about COVID-19. Then uh, the mathematics, very short, well, something like four slides about uh, the mathematics behind the MOCOS model. And then especially, as I said, the results of our group. And um, the, the main focus I will put on the, on the endemic threshold. So um, then that uh, means mathematics, if you have a disease, it's always a question, can you keep it somehow critical, uh, subcritical? And if not, can you somehow keep it on a certain level that uh, you can, for example, try to, to get a, the spread in a controlled way such that the, uh, the health system is not threatened? This is at all possible with COVID, for example. Um, such that you have a, some certain kind of herd immunity. And um, I, will, I will show you how this looks in our model, especially. So, um, like in the beginning, Misha said that I'm both interested in pure and applied mathematics, so I'm going to talk about applied mathematics, also mostly about modeling. So, um, and modeling, you see, it's, I, can, I can now say about every model, same. Uh, it's like uh, Niels Bohr said, it's very hard to predict, especially in the future. Um, you see this, uh, I put here um, from, from the um, Punch publications uh, from 1907, how <laughs> people were thinking about the future looks like. So you see there's some, some guy with a hat and some antenna and they have telegraphic machines and they're writing telegraphic uh, or telegram messages. To each other so of course we are not sitting around like this right but uh, if you think about it it's not so far away we don't have telegram machines anymore we don't have antenna we have something like small smartphones but uh, forecast is not so bad in that sense but of course it's completely wrong in the sense that if you talk about the the, uh, the techniques or the uh, you know, the apparatus that we use in the future, right? So uh, good and bad predictions are both common and um, especially in this time of pandemics, we know that. 
and um, there are maybe more wrong than correct ones we don't know that's that's also what you know from predictions you have to wait quite long um, and uh, also complex models um, can lead to this overfitting yeah? so you can have a very very complex model with beautiful mathematics and, and you, you really see that oh there are so many nice things to prove and um, we put some things more and they can still lead to, to wrong predictions yeah they it can be it could be that it doesn't fit at all to data anymore and then uh, you, you will have you have a, something like a very bad outcome you know we know this from some numerical methods when you want to fit a five points with a polynomial of degree 25 or something like this it hits all the points Right, but it doesn't maybe look like that what you want to have at the end of the day. Um, so, what are good models? And um, well, what what I want to say is these things that we are doing, we use them for predictions, but we use them quite late for predictions. So we started to do it to work with predictions maybe November last year. But the first part of the pandemic, um, our models were designed to shape some insights in the structure of the forecast program. That means um, it was not about um, how many deaths we have tomorrow. It's more about um, what happens if we do this and this non-pharmaceutical intervention, which we model by a certain way. For example, what happens if we if we enhance the backtracking? What happens if we if we have another lockdown or whatever? And um, this was more a qualitative view on this on this model, so we have to be a bit careful uh, when we talk about forecasting. Forecasting is always, in the, especially in a seasonal disease, uh, it's very dependent on the seasons or on the weather, and we know that it's very hard to predict the weather, at least uh, in non-tropical countries. So, um, well, there's already some some big issue with this. So. Um, the idea is to have a good model which shapes the insights of the forecast problem, right? Um, in the early days of the disease, there was this mistake by Rahul Gandhi, who said, oh, well, this is a failed lockdown in India. Yeah, see that um, we had uh, Spain, Germany, Italy, and UK. You see the, this exactly, the right hand side is exactly what you thought in Twitter. When it was just on top, there was uh, the, the failed lockdown or something, a sign of failed lockdown. But um, you see the mistake that he did here is a typical scaling mistake. So uh, Spain, Germany, Italy, and UK, they were all in the, in the exponential phase, right? in India also, obviously. Uh, but you cannot expect that, you, that the lockdown <laughs> somehow can immediately um, yeah, somehow finish uh, in the Indian uh, spread at the same time as uh, as in Germany, because there are just many many more people, and we have we have completely different uh, structures of the of the society. So it is it is somehow very very important to have these things in sight. For example, if if you compare typically uh, parts of Brazil and mega cities and, and Indian great mega cities with the cities in Europe, um, it's just that they have much more people living on. And households maybe in Brazil right now compared to for example I would, I would compare for example Manaus to Berlin to have much more single households in Berlin and this of course makes makes a big, big difference and in India it's much worse yeah? you, have, you have families which are very huge uh, sharing one household and um, this as we will see later on these households are really like a emphasizer for this for this for this whole disease spread yeah? and these structures we have to take into account so we have we have uh, local structures. We have something like a, a network structures, yeah. and of course Rahul Gandhi here forgot the scaling effect that India is just much much bigger than, than the others. Um, so how shall we predict? Yeah. So good predictions are difficult. Cannot anticipate the future. Alternatively. Model-based prediction. Model-based prediction means always what should we do to achieve a certain goal. So if you want to eradicate a disease, what should we do? Yeah. And um, we are all mathematicians. I hope some, hopefully some, at least a quantitative science. I don't know who is in the audience, but I, I believe that. Um, 
So everybody of us has most likely thought about a model or how one would model it. Yeah? And um, there is a theory behind this. Yeah? And, and why I chose a specific theory is because yeah, you are a specialist in this and this field or you can compute this and this, right? And then uh, suddenly you, you think about, okay, this is my viewpoint to this. Yeah? So there's, it's nothing more practical than a good theory. Especially when you when you want to know, um, yeah, what measure is doing this and this. What is this effect? You have to have a theory about the whole things, and you have to know where does this go inside of your model, right? And uh, this is somehow the, the main the main idea of this whole whole business, right? It doesn't matter how you model or what you model. It's it's just that you have something like your own insight into the theory. And you know what you can manipulate, and at the end of the day, you also should know the limitations of your model. Yeah? And by this, you can you can get these good predictions by saying something like, "What is the certain goal we should achieve?" achieve yeah? um, although I'm talking here a lot about agent-based models, which are maybe very sophisticated in some certain point of view because they are, yeah, they can resolve a lot of detailed information. On the other side, I'm also working with ODE models, standard ODE or standard push differential equation models, um, which also are perfectly fine, right? Um, you just have to know what the limitations are of these models. What is the problem with, with COVID-19 um, or with the modeling of COVID-19? Um, I, I, I just tell you the following things. Um, COVID-19 problem was everybody was at home and has a lot of time so there are a lot of publications yeah so that's that's what one can say uh, we have really, really like a vast of preprints since, since 2020 and it's very hard to keep track yeah? especially now with the what is the new variant how is the parameter of the new variant yeah how can you model this um, then there are new uh, intervention strategies what how you can model this if somebody has done that already and so on so to keep track is really like uh, we have we have one person which is doing nothing but every week check what are the current preprints which parameters we have to uh, uh, um, check we have to adapt and things like that yeah so it's it's really like very hard to keep track and i think that we didn't have that in the past so it's it's due to of course the rapid uh, digital digitalization of the world so everybody can actually directly publish and on the other side um, there are many many models needed also in, the, in different countries and developed for different groups yeah um, reliable data is often inaccessible um, what do I mean with this um, I hope everybody sees my cursor I hope here okay you see this down here as an old graphics from the Philippines where I also do uh, do modeling um, you see that uh, these are these are the total cases. This is linear scale, okay. And uh, you see that the growth is almost linear over a long period. Now, these are something like three months. It's almost linear. You could say it's almost a linear function. Um, so it was a bit strange because uh, one could assume that you are already in, or Philippines were already in an exponential phase. So why is this linear? And actually, it also looked like it's getting less you now. Of it. Um, well, the problem is that what we see is not disease cases, right? It's not the number of infected people. That what you see in Worldometer, if you open it, is the number of tested people, right? And the Philippines were for four months at the border of testing capacity. That's why you have lin linear function, right? If you have the maximum amount that you can do is 2,300 tests, let's say, per day. And uh, you are always at these 2,300 tests. Let's take just an arbitrary number. Then you get a linear function. Yeah? This will be the slope of your function. That's exactly what happened. So you cannot rely on this data at all. Moreover, another thing from the Philippines is um, you have here in blue the testing centers. Yeah, Philippines has a lot of nice islands. And in, in yellow, you have the number of cases. Yeah. And one has to say that this Mindanao here, this is um, so uh, to go from, from, from the north to the south is something like eight hours by, 
the driving is not a small island somehow. Um, so you see that you have a lot of cases around the region of Manila. Of course, you have also a lot of testing centers. You have a lot. You have a lot of cases around the region of Davao. You almost have nothing in, up here. Yeah, and also here on this island, overall you have nothing. The cases why you have nothing is just that you don't have a testing center. So uh, one has to be very careful. And at the at the beginning of the of the modeling. The idea of, of some modelers was we use exactly this data for an optimization problem where to put um, the ICU units or the intensive care units in the in the hospitals. And then it starts to get a bit crazy, right? So if you if you somehow give yourself a testing center somewhere and you say, okay, everything in walking distance somehow I can test, that's what you somehow see here, then of course there will be the beds for the ICU units, but you, you never know what happens in the in the regions without testing centers. And this is somehow a really big problem um, that, that a lot of mathematicians, a lot of modelers especially, um, are somehow believing in this data very much. But you have to be very critical about the data that you have. So data is very misleading. And uh, you have to find a good model for that. Yeah. So um, here in the Philippines, at some point, we used uh, yeah, not the PCR tests anymore. We used the other tests, and then we got it a bit under control. Um, but um, yeah, it's, it's still it's still a, a, a big problem. So just believe in data, and of course, if you have a lot of testing centers in some region, then you will have a, you will have a lot of regional cases in that region. Yeah, um, because in the other regions you don't test there are no cases. And then you have to be very careful about that. It's not that there are no cases; it's just that there are no tests of people. Um, moreover, it's like at the moment because of this. Um, this variance, you have to update your parameters regularly. Yeah, so it's a question on how quick um, is, your, is the spread of the disease and some things like that. So we, we never had uh, such a dynamic, I think, in the, by modeling something in the recent years. It's at least uh, since I'm doing that now for something like 12 years, and, uh, I never saw a disease which is just parameter updates in that. Uh, in, in this rapidness uh, and the speed. Okay. Yeah. So how you model? Um, there are classical models uh, which you usually can use. Yeah. Um, many of you maybe know the SIR model from maybe all the lecture. Uh, so you take you actually all of these models are SIR models in some sense. Um, but the SIR, classical SIR model does the following. You take your whole population and you put it into subcategories. There, I, I just say SIR, it could be much more. Huh? Could I SIR, then it could be quarantine compartment, there could be a death compartment, there could be a vaccinated compartment, there could be different compartments for ages and whatever you want. Yeah? But it's, it's a classical ODE model where the, the susceptible are transported to the infected, are transported to the um, to the recovered yeah, or removed, depends on, on who is giving the lecture in epidemiology, uh, a compartment. And um, yeah, it, it shows you a very good, let's say, overview of the disease, usually. And um, if you want to have more spatial resolution or more age resolution, you go usually either to the spatial models or to the metapopulation models. Metapopulation models means just you have different patches. Yeah? You can, for example, think of um, you take now certain states in Brazil, for example, and say every state has a patch, and then you link them by the commuting matrix, being the mobility matrix between them, and then you have a SIR model with patches, and you can already discuss there quite nicely uh, the resolution of, of the disease in the space direction, right? So not only time, but also space. And uh, this is a model which you use quite often because if you think about it, what data you have, well, you know the, how many disease cases I have in a certain state. Okay, I can access that. You have something like commuting matrix because the people maybe pay taxes and uh, you can get this out, so the mobility coupling you have. It's a quite nice model to have a, a good overview. Um, then there are something like individual based models where you let um, people run around and if they are close to each other, they have, they have some infection. This is, for example, something you usually use in um, if you want to model 
disease in, um, let's say, something like a shopping mall or on small, small entities. If you have bigger entities like here, um, then you can, for example, use, use the kernels to do that. So you have uh, something like a stochastic process, um, which is continuous in time, continuous in space, usually a continuous Markov process. And you have some transition kernels and um, you can use, for example, mark configuration spaces. What we are doing is typically network models. Um, there you have um, contacts of people are uh, linked by into a, a network. So you have everybody has a graph of people he meets or she meets, right? And um, then there are also these classes of susceptible infected and recovered. And um, now the question is how likely is that you, yeah, meet somebody in this graph and uh, if, if in your connection, if you are connected somehow to somebody who is, um, who is infected, then you have some certain probability, right? So, so the, the probability is both dependent on the transmission as, uh, as well as on the contact structure, right? So um, and by this, you can build up actually different, different uh, networks. And I will discuss about this, how this can be, for example, modeled um, in, uh, in before COVID. So we did exactly such a network model. Um, one thing I should maybe say, um, all these other models, so not this, this FNC, but the, the metapopulation model and the compartmental model can be seen as a scaling limit of this. If you do something like a, a mean field um, a limit, that means you, you just average out certain quantities, then you can come from the network model easily to the SIR model. Yeah? For example, with exponential waiting times or exponential weights here. Yeah? There, are, there are, is a big theory about that for different kind of graphs. And um, uh, you can then also, also somehow link the network model to the corresponding SIR model, and especially also to the transition, the local transition amplitudes to, a, to let's say, a more global transition amplitude. Um, if you work with a network and with contacts, um, then it's it's good to talk about um, yeah models which are also using this. And um, so there are actually two things which come in the game in the disease model that we are doing. One is uh, coagulation theory or um, theory of gelation, which is based going back to um, Swarovski, which you can see here. So um, the, the question is, um, if you have uh, particles meeting, how likely is that you get some certain clusters? Yeah, um, You can think about that, that this is exactly what you need. Yeah, So uh, you have, of course, the interaction between two persons, you have the interaction between one person and a, and a household of two, maybe one person and a household of three and something like this. And they all go to some sort of clusters and these clusters have some certain probability. And um, you can you can now, based on that, um, think about how your graph should look like yeah? or how later on your, your disease, based on the context, your, your, your disease spread is based on the context. Yeah? You, can, you can link this to the gelation theory here. So um, this Smolovsky equation, uh, equation describes how the clusters coagulate over time. And um, what is special inter of interest in, in the physics or what people looked at that is, for example, that in the gelation state, you have a sudden phase transition. Yeah? So you, you suddenly somehow jump from, um, from one state to the other, yeah? from liquid to solid yeah? or to, to gelation. And uh, these phase transitions are also important in disease because what it means is you jump from a, from something which you can, for example, control, like a cluster of two. It's sort of something you easy control. You know? Put a fence around it, don't let them out. They're isolated, everything is fine. To maybe something which is huge. And this one you cannot control. Yeah? So if you, if you have this transition in the disease, this means just that you go from the from uh, something like a very dilute clustering to something to mega cluster, which we call the giant component. Yeah. And um, the other theory based on 
linked to that is the Erdos Renetil with random crops. I don't want to go too much in the detail. I'm sure that, um, so um, I discussed also with Misha before that maybe crops are known, maybe random crops are not too known too much, but it's, it's perfectly fine. So what you have to know is the following. You have N nodes, N is huge. Yeah? And N is really mega, mega huge. Yeah? So if you have, for example, our model for Germany, we have 89 million uh, nodes. Yeah? So every human being based on the micro sensors in Germany is one node. Yeah? So it's huge, it's large. Um, the edges here represent um, relations. Relations can be, for example, contacts. Yeah? Usually uh, you will take the infectious contacts. Uh, and um, if you take the infectious contacts, you have some connectivity parameter. C, and uh, you say now in an Erdos-Rheni graph that um, the two nodes are connected with a certain probability. That means you, you have some random nodes, and now you, you, you roll, you have nodes, let's say, N, you put them somewhere, yeah? and then you roll dice to put edges between them. And you connect them with the probability C over N, where C is this connectivity parameter. And the number of neighbors, that means of connected, directly connected vertexes, is Poisson distributed with this parameter C. So we are really like a, having a random graph, so we generate this randomly. Um, typically, uh, uh, what one or the other have heard, yeah, in a party of six people, there are always three people who know each other and three people who don't know each other. This is, um, for example, if you, if you write, this is the party of six you see here in the graph. You can write this relation, and um, it was actually first of all um, invented to to do exactly this this theory behind. Um, so maybe one or the other knows the statement. Yeah. So it's somehow what we have is we have some connectivity parameter and some Poisson distribution, um, which is giving us the number of labels, right? Yeah. Or other said the connectivity. Is going directly in the probability that two nodes are connected. Nice. Okay. Now we have this thing. Okay. What what can we do with it? What do we know? Um, well, there is an endemic threshold. So if you put this parameter equal to one, suddenly something happens. So you have a giant component. Yeah. Giant component is let's say a, a huge connected set. Yeah. So like like here you have a giant component. Which connected, yeah. If you have, if you are close to the giant uh, to one, uh, you have something like small clusters, more or less small. Yeah? Let's say like here. So um, you have you have something like a very very small giant component, almost stays the same as with a small uh, dish. And suddenly you would jump, and you see the jump is really like huge. Yeah? So you have here a phase transition. You jump from something which is a very, which is very very small connected units to something which has a a huge 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 size. Yeah? And you can see this here. So you have suddenly there appears a giant connected thing, and that the the, the larger the degree is the of the nodes that the worse it is, yeah? or, or the larger C is actually a connectivity parameter. You can say connectivity parameter of one you jump. So uh, this is called the percolation threshold. So how many edges are needed to be added uh, before the giant component um, appears. And um, you have a sudden appearance of this. So how can we interpret this in the, in the, in the, um, yeah, in the disease card point of view? So let's assume we have really that every edge is an infectious contact. Then the appearance of giant components mean actually that you're disease is starting to get, getting endemic. Yeah. So uh, suddenly you have a lot of connected um, connected points, which means you have a lot of points infected. Yeah. And um, this is maybe something you cannot control anymore. Yeah. So um, we, we call this C equal to one, is that what maybe the one or the other heard about basic production number are not. Yeah. You, can, you can somehow see it as this. Yeah. So this um, the appearance, so the connectivity parameter when this um, when this giant component is appearing is exactly this. 
Um, but I will talk about the basic production number and the setting a bit more. Um, so the Erdős Kémi graph, um, or SIR, epidemics in random graphs, how you do it, yeah? you take um, SIR categories, so you assign to every node, every infected, or well, every, every person, you, you assign, okay, the guy is healthy, he is infected, or he has been infected, he is immune. Yeah? You can also go back, of course, now to a susceptible end that we have heard. The edge is representing the infectious contacts. A connected component is the set of individuals which become eventually affected um, if there is an initial infected in the component. So, um, of course, you have done a lot of con contacts. Yeah? So, we have now really the contacts and then put on that again another infection tree in the contacts. And we want to keep the giant component small. Yeah? In addition, if you want to have a more or less realistic um, disease progression, you also need to assign a certain random time, that means a serial interval, which um, tells you how long it needs until you have two consecutive infections. Yeah? This will not happen directly after each other, but you have a minimal time. So you have some waiting time until this happens. And this waiting time, some of you have maybe heard about super spreaders. Yeah? Um, that the waiting time is quite low, uh, quite small. They have a lot of contacts, that's why they're super spreaders. And you can model a bit uh, your the disease progression with this one. And you can also put, for example, a serial interval as a feature uh, for certain groups, if you like. Yeah? Um, and the random graphs with these travel times along edges are studied in, I said, this, this first passage speculation theory. There are uh, big papers by People like Van der Hochstadt um, in Annals Probability doing exactly this. So they, they really check about um, first special speculation time, um, which is highly non standard stochastic analysis. Yeah? Or it says probability action. So that's, that's how you, on a nutshell, model this. But still, this is not cool. <laughs> not that what we want. Because at the moment, every node is the same. Yeah, so if you just do the Erdős Vénik graph, we have some connectivity parameter, every node looks the same. Yeah, that means especially um, it doesn't make a difference if I am a student, if I am um, a kindergarten kid, if I am 85 years old. Yeah, I am a vertex. And this is not good because if you want to do this in a, in a model which is more, more, you know, Resolve in, in specific strata. You need to put in age progression, uh, so, so age dependent disease progression. You would have to put on uh, something like um, uh, different different groups of people. Yeah, for example, there are, there are people who are working in a, in, a, in a university like me. We have a lot of clients, like students. If there is no lockdown, yeah? there are people who don't. And there is, for example, also a connectivity parameter should be. And somehow, in some sense, also dependent on the lockdown status at the moment. Yeah. Um, for this, um, we will generalize this a bit. In the Erdős-Rémi theorem, though, so if we stay for a second in this, in that what I just said, and just look at the parameter C, because if you understand what happens in the parameter C, then we understand the theory later a bit better. Um, we have that um, for C less than one, only small connected component size of at most logarithm of n um, is there, and they are tree-like. So they are very, very controllable. Yeah? Log n is not so big. For C equal to one, you have uh, suddenly a several large components of the size um, two, n to the power two over three. And so the diameter of the components is um, third root of n, which is already quite huge. And if, if C is larger than one, there exists a unique giant component of the size rho times n with diameter log n over log C. This is a standard theorem, and rho is the largest solution of rho is equal to one minus e to the power C rho. So you, you can somehow really do some direct analysis of this, and you can do forecasts with this model that I said already, and this is very, very non-trivial, and it's still used, yeah. There are a lot of people doing the disease on the average clinic graphs, 
and um, this role you can describe in the sense of a branching process by exactly um, describing the, the, the survival probability in the adish Lenny graph. Yeah. So um, this is actually what the theory here says. And if you want to kick a notch a bit, um, we do not the following. We don't take the C2 in, into account anymore, but we now define kernels between edges. And this is where somehow the more realistic models start. But while the early Schrelin theory, you can do everything somehow by hand, more or less, or you can use theorems which are there. And this Bolobash, Janssen, and Jordan random graphs, where you are somehow having these kernels which are representing the um, the probability transity, the, so the transition probability. Yeah? So we like the probability to be connected. Um, uh, there you can, of course, do the stuff mostly numerically. Yeah? The more heterogeneity you put on the kernels, the, yeah, the more you are somehow, uh, it's, it's important to, to have a numerical simulation. So again, you have n vertices, yeah? And they have properties. So the properties are now different features. So they could, for example, be age, um, gender. It could be something like um, education status, poverty status, whatever you want. Yeah? So we put here really like things from the census. So we take the micro census of Germany, the poverty index, we put that there. Um, the edges then are based on the, um, the features. Uh, so the, the edges, are, the, the connectivity of the edges is based on these features. So for example, I can say that this feature could be, I work in a Ford company and I have the connectivity index is something like to all my all the people working in the same Ford company, some car company, let's say. And um, then it means that the, I have a connection to this one with a high probability, let's say like eight hours a day I meet this guy, so I will have I will have some, some connectivity kernels to these things. Yeah. So the kernel accounts the local social structure. I will tell you later on what we modeled here. And um, right, we have here intrinsic medical features, um, age and whatever. Yeah. So the, the, later on, we have a lot of different kernels, which sum up to the maximum probability that we have. Um, so now, the connectivity constant is not directly done by these kernels, but um, is overtaken by the so-called transfer operator. The transfer operator is actually a convolution operator on an observable. Yeah? And what I do is just a convolute respect to mu. I didn't say what mu is. Um, wait. Yeah, we have uh, mu is the asymptotic distribution of this of this values of x i. So, um, okay, given that, I can now say that the, the phase transition actually is given by the operator norm in a certain Hilbert space of this t. So if t is equal to one, um, I have exactly the endemic threshold condition. So this transfer operator with all of these kernels I plug, I plug inside tells me actually the existence of a giant component. This one is shown, this one is known, and you can really rely this. And in SIR dynamics, this norm of this T can be interpreted as the reproduction number R0. So then what happens now is that um, this transfer operator is covering the, the connectivity that means the whole infection process. Why are these kernels? The kernels tell you the, the, the transition probability, or let's say connectivity probability between two nodes. Again, you can do the same as before. Yeah, before we had this row, and but now we have the transfer operator on this row, and we can still say that the probability uh, of an individual to be in this giant component is given by this, the solution of this here, of this equation. Of course, you cannot solve this by hand anymore if, if the operator is um, a bit strange yeah, or more complicated. Yeah, but uh, asymptotically, you can you can usually say something. And um, yeah, but I don't want to go too much on here. So you can have multi-type, multi-branching uh, stuff. 
But his transfer yeah. operator, you should have in mind, this is somehow playing the role of this armor. Or the norm of it, it plays the role of the armor. And, and again, you can now say how big the, the giant component is. Before you had log n over log c, now you have log n over the log of the uh, two norm of this operator. Yeah? And um, then you can put also the, the generation times there. Um, and then you can think about, okay, what is a typical subcritical phase? And um, we have actually that the time tip extinction in such a model, you can compute and you can see it's logarithmic uh, dependent on the on the number of the initial infected. That means the initial infected doesn't play such a big role. Yeah? So um, the the time is actually dominated really by the uh, by the generation time, which means actually the serial interval. Right. Okay. So this is in a nutshell the mathematical theory behind the Morphos model. So the model that we use. So we have a lot of different kernels. And now we can go to the to resolve what what kernels do we have to use. Yeah? And we have here from Poland um, data for 40,000 persons. Um, now it's already a bit more. Well, this 40,000 persons was in November last year. So um, and we have actually everything from them. So something like when are they hospitalized? When did they have their um, symptoms, um, where did the, the infection most likely contact, the infectious contact happen, and something like this. You can do a model plot of that, and you see that, of course, there are a lot of things happening. So this was a, in, a, in a mining, uh, so in the coal mine, there was some big, big uh, infection. But um, if you look at that, actually, this, this pink, um, contribution, you know, this pink uh, background, this is nothing else but the household context. And the household plays such a big role, yeah? much more than schools. Okay, schools were closed at some certain point. But the household infection is, of course, dominating here. So, of course, if you have somebody in your household, you have close contacts, and it's nothing that is somehow um, surprising. So it's completely it's completely clear. Okay, so you have you have the households play a key, a key contact, a uh, uh, key um, role, and uh, if you look at look at this from the network point of view, um, you can see that the households actually look like this in the network. Yeah. So let's now say we have just connected vertices. So you have maybe households of two, maybe households of three, households of four, and so on. Okay, that's perfectly fine. Um, if you now connect the households. Just by, yeah. So you have a connection of these two, a connection of these two. Suddenly, it's immediately you get a big connection. So uh, the household somehow boost the connection because, of course, you have more than one individual in the household, and a kid usually have different friends than than um, a grown up. It should be like that. That means you can draw different connections, and this makes just your network huge. So the households really boost the, uh, the infection process. Yeah. That's why sometimes in Europe they said you should just meet five people yeah, because of everybody should just meet five people. But but you see that you have you have really to check how big is actually the household. Yeah? If you have a household of uh, eight, maybe the grandmother lives there with you and something like this, um, and everybody is allowed to meet five people, then it's maybe too big already. Yeah? Can have a lot of uh, in a household network. Uh, if you if you say that is every of this household would be a cluster um, or a vertex actually, and then then you don't need much connections to get back to a giant component and to a giant network. Um, what does it bring? Okay, uh, sorry, this is Polish. <laughs> My friends in Poland that uh, yeah, but um, thank you very much. So um, if you have the standard SARR model and you, um, you take the endemic threshold, as seen from before, so the connectivity parameter, and this one is the contact reduction. So you, 100 is no con uh, no, zero is no contact reduction, 100 is full contact reduction. Uh, what happens if you put the contact reduction down, 
Connect connectivity parameter, you see that in the model with households, this is this model fuzzy two here, you have the phase transition and a much, much earlier contact reduction than for the standard SIR model, which is corresponding to the, to the LR Shredi, where you don't have households. So the households itself, so the appearance of households play a key role in this, and uh, that's actually one of the things that we're looking at the moment uh, in, in theory. Um, so the, um, you, you can somehow model this small network structure inside, and then you can see what is the average um, size of a household or the variance of the distribution of the household sizes telling you in such a way. Um, so what do we have inside of the Morcos model? We have the household kernel, of course. That means we model household contacts, we model sporadic contacts. That means what happens in flat transports and these are non-traceable. So this is something that we have to assume. Um, we have for Poland some friendship network, um, which is based on uh, social science models. So we have models in social science which tell you set friendship kernels. It's also not very well studied, but it's getting more and more studied. Um, but for, for example, we have this age specific kernels, that means how's the age progression. This you can read up from the medical data. You can also read something like hospital kernels, that means how is the disease progression in the hospital, right? So you can say, you assign, for example, a time to, to a node when it's infected and when it's eventually hospitalized. So if it has a, have a severe, there's some certain probability this has a severe case and when it's hospitalized and then how long does the hospitalization usually last uh, until it's either recovered or dead. These things we have inside, we have some certain workspace kernels inside, so for certain um, yeah, companies, so for certain, um, yeah, let's say, um, types of workspaces. So for example, like you work together with 30 people, you work together with 100 people, so we have different, different cases of, uh, of these which are at the moment also modeled by the University of Erlangen. They have some, some individual based models from that and based on that, we had some, we modeled some kernels inside. Uh, the tool is actually done now. We have geometric and, ge and geographical kernels, which tells you how you go from the one. Um, yeah, for example, you see, say somebody is living in, uh, in Manaus, the other one is living in, in Brasilia. And then the question is um, how, how likely is that they meet uh, these are ge geographical kernels based on commuting and migration. And uh, then you just do the following. You associate, calculate random times of being infectious. Uh, these are Poisson distributed, so this is, you, can, you can compute these random times. And um, you have a basic intensity of the specific contacts. So um, what, you, what you actually get is an individual Poisson intensity for every number of secondary cases and then you let the whole thing run and um, you sample then from this from this value with the possible ident intensity given by these parameters based on the kernels. Yeah, I told you this. Um, contact C is actually now given by the transfer operator so you have actually possible intensity based on this one. And then you later on allocate random times let's say like when are people um, getting um, infected and whatever. And um, yeah, so why is this important? So um, it's important because with agent-based models you can do contact tracing. Yeah? Um, contact tracing is something that is at the moment used very much um, to, let's say, as a non-pharmaceutical intervention strategy. So um, let's say you have here in the, the red one is an infected person and um, you have a positive test uh, contact. And now the question is, um, where, does, where does this come from? So usually um, you some people in the health office take the telephone and then they call typical contacts that he knows of, some he knows, some maybe he forgot, but you will find eventually some contacts and then you can find other positive contacts because all, the, all of these contacts are assumed to be tested which can be offsprings of other contacts. So you can, you can trace back um, the, um, yeah, where they are coming from. So which one is the infected contact, uh, infectious contact. And this is important because COVID is somehow also infectious, as you know, maybe in the pre and asymptomatic uh, phase. 
That means you can find something like those people which are pre or asymptomatic or actually in the mild case. Yeah? You could have somebody sitting at home, thinks he has a cold, but actually has COVID. You can find it with this. And um, then you have a household quarantine until the negative test result arrives. That's what we have here in Germany. So you have actually that this household quarantine, you take the guy from out of the system and um, an effective contact tracing really can put the endemic under control. And that's what we also saw if you make data, uh, we check the, um, the data that we had. So you have some contact trees, where are they coming from? So you have different colors and all of this was standing here, still now telling you when is the guy hospitalized, when he was tested, when was a positive negative test result and so on. It's a very nice data set. We are unfortunately not allowed to give out at the moment due to um, data protection um, reason, but uh, we make some tests that, um, that people can also try. Um, that what we actually did with our algorithms so, and what, what you need, you can, you can see there. So the linked clusters here are somehow, um, so, so you, you have something like a, a cluster going back to some certain people. Yeah? So this one, for example, um, some, some clustering of people going back to some, let's uh, say the green one is going back to this patient here. And um, you, now, you now have something like this contact structure and uh, you can think now uh, about how, how likely is the contact tracing or you can really deduce uh, how good the contact tracing is. So, um, you have something like um, a forward probability yeah, to, to find other contacts before they actually infect, but also you have a backward probability. So you run the process backwards by finding, let's say, the offsprings and trying to somehow um, yeah, prevent the craft to, uh, to create more offsprings. Yeah. And um, so the conclusions of this are the faster you trace, you have means a shortened time delay between the positive test result and the finding the links is, uh, is very good. It's, it's making it, I will also show some figures what it means. Um, it's optimal. Um, you should uh, have a high success rate of finding infect links. This is somehow clear. You can use, for example, mobile data, um, AI, or whatever, um, whatever is allowed with data protection in your country. Extensive testing is um, means you meet the test criteria. Yeah. So we had, for example, in, in Germany at some point not enough tests, and then they said, okay, we don't test anybody, everybody anymore, and then we have immediately something like an outbreak. We'll so come to this in a second. And social distancing and, and protection. And of course, one should not stop the countermeasures too early because if you stop the countermeasures too early, it will just um, go on. You should really wait until the cases are somehow almost close to zero. Yeah? Okay, now um, this is these are four figures where we actually have here on the side the, the, the contact tracing effectiveness, and this is the reduction number. And, in these heat maps, you see everything which is blue is somehow very good. That means you have an eradicated um, disease. The, the green one is that what we call the mitigation threshold. It is exactly the interval where you have a, this, exactly this phase transition. Yeah? That means you have um, R not equal to 1 if you want so. And this one is, of course, uh, the epidemic. So you have an epidemic. So if you have a tracking of one a delay of one day, you see that um, if you have something like a moderate contact tracing, we had 70% in Germany at one point, you just need 80% of the um, of contact reduction, so it's, which is already quite nice. You don't have to go down to, to 30. Yeah? So uh, you, you just um, no, you don't have to go down to 100. You can already uh, maybe with mask do something. So this contact reduction means really contact reduction in comparison to the free uh, or non-COVID contacts. Yeah? If you have two days, you see if you are at 60, you are, it's almost the same, but um, yeah, it, it gets less and less. And it's, at some point, yeah, um, this contact tracing effectiveness doesn't play any role anymore. So, uh, this tracking delay is somehow at some point dominating. 
So you should really try to, to keep the tracking delay low, something like one day, and then you can also get more contact. So if you have a very good contact tracing, you can actually almost um, yeah, live freely, let's say. Um, it's also very important to detect the mild cases because the mild cases have something like an asymptomatic, if you have some, yeah, if the asymptomatic and the mild cases, they, they give you some offsprings you usually don't find yeah, if, if people come to the hospital. Yeah? And um, if you now detect the mild cases, you, you have you have some, some uh, similar results. So if you have here down the contact reduction rate, this one is the contact tracing efficiency which we have seen. That means we, we trace the contacts back. And this one is the detection of the mild cases, which you eventually find by, let's say, um, uh, based on based on the contact tracing yeah so you, you find uh, them so contact tracing is usually you somebody's going to the um, to the uh, to the doctor and then you ring the phone and you trace back and then you have some certain probability to find uh, the mild cases with this so if this one is high so if you find a lot of uh, mild cases you actually can almost live freely. So you see, zero percent means that we have no reduction. Yeah? So um, you see that the uh, this mild case detection is actually that what 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 is playing a key role. So not really the contact tracing efficiency, but how many mild cases you find, because the mild cases are somewhat driving this. Yeah? So if you if you see there are a lot of asymptomatic infections, uh, infections by asymptomatic people. Um, and small changes in the testing traded strategy can lead to huge prevalences. So let's say I'm sitting here, which is perfectly fine, and now somebody says I don't test that much, then immediately I can get, get critical. Yeah? So if, if I don't find that many people, then it means that I go vertically up. So I can, with the same number of contact reduction, I can, because this interval here is very, 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 very small, I can just jump into the red. The red zone, and that's what actually happened in Germany in November 2020. Um, the idea is we just test cases with severe symptom, uh, symptom um, uh, so you don't have any mild symptom anymore. Uh, maybe somebody who has the flu, comes with the flu, and but also has COVID, and COVID maybe. But um, yeah, it's very. It was it was somehow that it, you don't really um, find the mild case anymore if you just test the severe symptoms, and you you see that um, you have a stronger contact reduction, so lockdown light was there, and 75% uh, of the positive cases were without knowing the origin. So what happened by just testing this uh, case with severe symptoms was actually you were on a very, very mild rate, but then you, you go vertically up and the thing went critical. Yeah? If you would have a higher backtracking or contact tracing to efficiency, uh, then you would actually maybe run to mitigation interval, yeah, but we didn't. Yeah. So this this was a development which we also criticized a lot and which we could actually see already in our um, model coming. Okay, so uh, maybe some minutes on tracking with an app. So with an app, it's really like uh, you need a number, a certain number of people who are having this app. So um, the app is usually having a delay of one day due to data protection reasons. So it's I don't want to see on my display, or I should not see on my display, that the one who is in front of me having COVID, um, but it tells you that there was somebody having COVID in the day and then you have to go to the doctor, yeah, because you don't want to have stigmatization there in your um, population. And But you need a significant number of users. So this one is the, the fraction of users you need. Again, here we have contact reduction. So you see, if you have um, in the mild case detection, so you say you don't find anybody, then uh, to have to have some change in the in the contact reduction, you need almost one hundred percent having this app installed. And if you if you think about uh, that, small kids and very old people have no smartphones, then this is already something you can completely forget. If you have a higher mild case de um, detection. This actually what is then dominating, so the, the app doesn't bring you that much. But if you if you would have sixty percent already, you can go to to thirty percent of contact reduction, which is already quite nice. Yeah? So, uh, but therefore you would need fifty percent of the of the mild cases you find. So you need 
actually a lot of people having this app because you see here you have something like a vertical line and um, if you have some, something just like 40 percent that we had in germany using this app it doesn't really contribute a lot yeah. um, about super spreading um, maybe two words we have few people who infect a lot of people and um, this means we have a power, power tail distribution in the number of contacts. We don't have any more something than adoption, but there's a power fat tail. Huh? So, um, and um, uh, we, we just made some some interesting, we made some runs about that, um, where we truncated the tail. That means we said, okay, uh, these guys are not allowed to meet too many people. And this alpha here is actually the, uh, the power load distribution. So the, extra power alpha we go down with so and uh, and you see if you truncate the tail of it after some certain after some certain level then this tail truncation is really like um, uh, if you go down to 20 percent it really helps you with the super spreading but i mean if you if your alpha parameter is too big then again you have a, you have a problem but this tail truncation that means to tell people not to meet too many people not everybody is really like like helping you and so you can for example say maximum of 20 people is allowed and then um, yeah, or something like that okay so uh, very recently um, we used this polish patient data um, to estimate the in-hold age dependent attack rate that means we can say how in a household on age dependently um, the disease is progressing and um, also the case severity rate that means if you have if you are infected with, with COVID how, how severe it will be also the death rate of course and um, what more we did is we did a dark figure estimate but the dark figure estimate is actually very rough and therefore we have a very high confidence intervals although um, it's, it's a feasible um, it's a feasible dark figure um, we recently found out in Germany in a serological, um, yeah, in a serological uh, experiment that um, there are, is, is minimum a quarter of people who, uh, who is infected who didn't know that they were infected before. Um, okay, so what more is done? Um, recently, there are these US. Uh, COVID-19 crowd forecasts and crowd forecasts are now very popular so you have a, have a, a machine learning uh, method uh, based on the um, on a lot of models which are making the forecast and then based on that you have some combined forecast or some, some ensemble models uh, we have this now in European Union too and also here we do some forecast and uh, usually on, in number of deaths and number of um, infected in Poland we are uh, on number one in Germany. We don't let it run at the moment because of the data. Uh, don't have too much uh, too much German uh, resolved data. It's a bit of a problem. But um, uh, on, the, on the European level, as, as Misha already said, our forecasts are in the top three um, among the death and the, and the predictions of the of the cases. So um, this is the. From our web page, uh, which comes in a second, so mocos.pl, um, the prediction for the for Poland. So, so you see that um, we are now here. So it is from the 30th of 30th of August, um, and uh, yeah, we have here some some percentiles. So um, you will see, you see, that unfortunately, yeah, the cases will most likely go up, but it's at the moment the case the case in Europe that we have, even with the vaccine edge. You know? Okay, good. So this is Mokos. So Mokos Poland, Mokos Philippines, Germany, and India. Everything was actually founded by Till Krüger, who is um, um, a specialist in uh, also in HIV modeling. And um, yeah, the, this, this model is uh, some of development of, of his uh, further models. And you can see everything that we did in Mokos.pl. There's much more. Um, also, the recent publications are there. Also, the preprints you can find in mocos.pl. If you like, just take a look at this. Um, 
And um, yeah, we are also happy if we could do something in Brazil. If somebody is interested, um, just contact me. And uh, if you have any more questions, then feel free to ask. I think I already um, took more than one hour. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Wolfgang. Uh, do there any questions? Maybe from internet, from YouTube tra translation. Hudson? Hello. Uh, let me see. Right now, the, there are any questions. Okay, then I have a question. Uh, what kind of data is uh, re reliable? What kind of data you can use? Because you told that uh, many data is not reliable and cannot be tra trusted. Yeah, uh, that's indeed a big problem. Um, so we have, the, we are lucky because we are working with um, Polish and German um, government, actually also Philippine government. Um, so we have directly data from the DOH. Department of Health usually, and in Poland even a bit more, um, where we have uh, complete content trees, and based on that you can you can really um, get a network structure. Um, based on the on the on the on the case numbers, um, you can you can somehow get a trend, yeah. But you have to be careful because you don't see the dark figure, and um, the more people are infected. Which you don't see, the more people are immunized, yeah? and this, this makes this makes a, a big big problem. So, what is reliable data? Um, well, actually, really the data from the um, from the uh, from the traced from the traced data, and based on that, if you know this is a household infection, is not that's that's for example the best data that you can have, and based on that you can make dark figure estimations. Yeah, so um, you can use for example. Like we did, we did some uh, median estimator to, to get the dark figures or the severity rates, and you can based, um, work based on that. Um, however, in most of the things that that we did here to, let's say, checking um, yeah, this, this testing, checking this, this back tracking, this is not really related to data. Yeah, we can start with a number of people and we can just say we let the disease run through until everybody's infected. And this is somehow invariant on how many people I have because I just look at the end of the disease. Yeah, the end of the disease means really you, you infect everybody and either the disease is eradicated or not. Yeah, that's the, that's the, the heat maps we see. And then you can ask yourself what is a certain efficiency doing? Yeah, so let's say you find 30% of the cases. Yeah. So this is not data related, uh, related, and based on that you can do really um, some qualitative estimates or qualitative uh, yeah, um, results. Thank you very much. Well, do we have any other questions? Okay, it seems no. So let us send the World Bank for the very nice talk. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, we'll continue uh, next time. Thank you, everyone. And I think we can stop right now. Uh, stop the translation. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. The, the, uh, now we can, I think, finish the seminar. And until next time. Okay. See you. See you. Bye.